up to 80% of women experience pain with their menstrual cycle. So this is a really significant portion of the population that has experienced pain. In medical school, doctors only receive a few hours of training on chronic pain in general, uh, and even less on these really specific um, chronic pelvic pain conditions. Welcome to Startup Health TV, where we celebrate the entrepreneurs and innovators who are transforming health. I'm Logan Plaster, here with Margaret Melville, the CEO and co-founder of Lhasa Health. Margaret, great to see you again. Thank you so much for having me. So I want to start, uh, when I was preparing for the interview, I looked up your website, and you have a very intriguing quote at the top of the website that was from a, an OBGYN who had been in practice for 30 years. So I want you to paraphrase the quote for me and explain why that was important for you. Right, so this OBGYN said, I, I still get squeamish and have a sense of dread when I see chronic pelvic pain on my chart. Mm. And this is something that we heard from hundreds of physicians uh, who had extensive experience in OBGYN um, but did not feel comfortable treating this patient population. Mm. And it really comes down to, one, it's an extremely complex <laughs> condition. There's a, a thousand things that could be the underlying cause and the lack of training. So in medical school, doctors only receive a few hours of training on chronic pain in general uh, and even less on these really specific um, chronic pelvic pain conditions. So you've got OBGYNs who are experienced and very well intentioned and in their desires to serve the patient and yet they are feeling dread at this. Then you've got the patient side. You've got women whose pain is not being taken care of. Talk about that challenge. How big of an issue is chronic pelvic pain uh, in the population. Yeah, it impacts about one in four women. And wow. that's non-cyclical pelvic pain, so that's pelvic pain not associated with the menstrual cycle. Mm. And then up to 80% of women experience pain with their menstrual cycle. So this is a really significant portion of the population that has experienced pain on a, a regular basis. And oftentimes, the majority don't have a diagnosis, don't have a reason behind the pain, uh, which leaves them wondering and questioning, why is this happening? Is yeah. this normal? Am I, do I need to go to the emergency room? What yeah. is going on? Yeah. And chronic pain, it's just this sort of silent, it's, uh, you know, it's, it reduces your life. So what are some of the things that, some of the sort of downstream negative impacts of just chronic pain at the scale you just talked about? Yeah. I think the biggest thing I think about is the research so shows that if that chronic pain can be resolved in the first six months, mm. the patients have pretty good outcomes. But when it's there for more than six months, it changes the way our bodies process pain. And then it becomes really, really difficult to treat. So even once the underlying condition is identified and treated, the patient often has lingering pain for the rest of their lives. Mm. Uh, so our goal is to get patients' pain diagnosed and treated within that six month period. But what we're fighting against is right now, the time to diagnosis is about 10 years. Oh my gosh. So we are trying to exponentially decrease the time to diagnosis so that these patients have better long-term outcomes for their health. Okay, so we've outlined the challenge. It's a great segue to what is LASA Health? What are you building to solve that problem? Great. So LASA Health is a patient navigation platform really connecting the provider and the patient to help them navigate the healthcare system. So we have AI machine learning tools for the clinician, uh, decision support tools that help them understand which patients likely have these chronic pelvic pain conditions, mm -hmm. give them the confidence to manage these patients and information about what treatment options are available for them. And then on the patient side, we also give them education and tools to learn about their condition and how to manage it from home so that the patient and the provider can really work together with a chronic care management lens to manage these really complex patient cases. Now break this down for me because the, the OBGYN we started talking about from, with 30 years of experience didn't feel like they had the tools mm -hmm. or the knowledge or whatever to handle this, this, this patient. Uh, have we learned more about the patients? Is it just a matter of having the technology to combine all the data points? How is it that we're now able to address some of these needs better than that OBGYN that we talked about? Yeah, that's a really great question. It's still not perfect. There needs to be more research. There needs to be more therapeutics. But a lot of physicians aren't aware of of some new research, new innovations that have happened in this space. So I've talked to patients who have had 10 surgeries for pelvic pain and decades of suffering and have never even been referred to pelvic floor physical therapy, mm. which is can be a really effective strategy. Um, similar, they, there's basic drugs that are common in pain management that they've never been prescribed or never tried. Uh, so I think there's a, a 
th there's just a, a lack of awareness about what treatment options there are for these patients and what the right next steps can be. Interesting, interesting. Talk to me about how the industry is responding because this is just, whether we're talking about uh, a, a woman's pain in general or, or you know, pelvic, chronic pelvic pain, we're talking about an area that's been chronically ignored or undertreated, and now you're, you're pitching these, this product to an industry uh, that may or may not be receptive to it. Are you seeing that tide change? How are people responding to the need to think about chronic pelvic pain more seriously? Yeah, that's a great question. I think we're really seeing a change in tide. Um, okay. that specifically, Jill Biden's initiative for women's health, $100 million of federal funding for women's health, and specifically calling out endometriosis nice. is one of those critical areas. Endometriosis impacts one in 10 women and is one of the leading causes of chronic pelvic pain and these patients that I'm talking about. So we're seeing interest and momentum um, you know, with women's health. It's, it's, it's being recognized as this next wave of chronic conditions that are costing a lot of money for our Medicare and Medicaid programs, are causing a lot of pain and suffering, and have a huge opportunity to, to change our workforce, to change our population, and to just take care of our women better. Uh, that was a relatively recent um, uh, shift that happened, right? Mm -hmm. When did that come out, the, the Jill Biden thing? Uh, she announced the initiative in November, and then okay. she announced the funding, I think, just last week. Last week. Okay, yeah. fantastic. Uh, how are you thinking through how you validate uh, outcomes? I'm sure you're working with folks that are going to ask whether this is good for their ROI, whether this is good mm -hmm. for, you know, patient data. Uh, how do you validate? Yeah, great question. So a, a few areas, emergency room visits are one of the most high cost areas for this patient population. They're four times more likely to go to the emergency room than a, a patient who does not have chronic pelvic pain. And, and these visits are actually increasing. So in the past 10 years, ER admissions for endometriosis have doubled. Mm. Um, so it's it's getting worse, it's not getting better. More, and, more visits and I'm, I'm only imagining that that 30 year veteran OBGYN, if they're confused about what the do than the ER physician. Most ERs do not have an, a gynecologist on call. So like, what kind of care are they even providing at that point? Exactly. So at the emergency room, it's, it's a really critical piece because there are emergent causes of pelvic pain like mm, right. appendicitis or ovarian torsion or ovarian cysts rupturing, ectopic pregnancies, and those things need to be taken really seriously. So every time a patient goes to the ER, they're given a full workup to right. check for all of these life-threatening things that could be causing it. And when it's none of those things, they're told there's nothing pathologically wrong with you, you know. Take some Motrin. Take some Motrin. Go home. Yeah. yeah I've just, been to the uh, ER three times for pelvic pain. Wow. The first time they did a full workup, but the other times they just gave me ibuprofen and patted me on the head and said, take, take a bath, try a heating pad, which, um, you know, wow. In retrospect, it's like I would have rather had a tool as a patient that could help me manage my pain from home um, so that I could have avoided the cost of the ER visits and yeah. the discomfort of sitting in the waiting room for hours and running through all those tests that were unnecessary. Can you get practical for us how the tool uh, would have helped you in that moment? Mm -hmm. So the tool specifically we've been building as part of the National Science Foundation's SBAR grant mm -hmm. that we were awarded last year. And this is an AI chatbot that helps patients work through these flare-ups. Mm -hmm. So flare-ups are basically moments in these conditions where the pain is heightened or worse. And this is the times where they're at risk of going to the emergency room. So what we do is we help the patients to implement a prevent a prevention plan, but then also put a plan in place for when there is a crisis. Okay. So when they're not in crisis, we have them put on a plan. So when I start feeling pain, here are the early signs. Here's what I'm going to do. Here's the medications I have prescribed to me that I can use. Here are the techniques that work for me. And then the chatbot helps them through that moment of crisis to remind them, okay, let's take that medication. <laughs> let's, yeah. let's go take a bath. Let's get your heating pad. Let's do some stretches. Yeah. And I think the most important thing it does is helps the patient not catastrophize their pain. Yeah. Because the biggest fear is, you know, you're in so much pain and then you start to panic. Yeah. And you say, am I dying? Yeah. Like, what is going on with me? And so the chatbot can help really calm the patients, make them feel like someone's listening, someone's cares, someone's going to help them through this. There's a light on the other side. We're going we're gonna to get through this pain flare up together. <sighs> It's, it's so huge. You know, the fact that you mentioned the ER visits makes me think about what has to go through someone's mind to decide to go to the emergency department. It's like you say, a catastrophe. Like you have to really feel 
terrible. It is, a, it is an awful feeling to feel like your only uh, option is to go into an emergency department and sort of say, I'm, I'm scared, this is some big emergency. So to have a, a chatbot that's kind of holding your hand through that and saying, no, we can work through some options, not only helps you with the pain, but helps you with that emotional burden. Exactly. It's, 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 it's wild. So what are you most excited about for what's next, next, say, 12 months? Mm. What's next is really integrating this into ER visits and okay. um, and starting to pilot with some health systems. Uh, this this technology has a ton of potential for patients and also for health systems to their ER departments are flooded with patients yeah. and if they can avoid unnecessary visits from this patient population or at least reduce the, the, the time it takes for one of these patients to have a visit because they're able to have the resources provided on our platform. Um, we can really make the doctor's lives easier <laughs> as well as help a lot of patients who are going to the ER every single month um, when they're in crisis and they don't know what else to do. I love it. Well, Margaret, it's been exciting to see you uh, grow. You got that SBIR grant. And I know you've been uh, working on some new partnerships, and so you've been able to see this uh, product work in real life and help real people. And I think 2024 could be a real inflection year for mm -hmm. the company. So look forward to getting the next update. Great. Thank you so much. Thanks All for having right. me. Thanks, Margaret.